I love Holy Week. For me, it's a week of trying to walk where Jesus walked. It starts with Palm Sunday, an exuberant, joyful day. It moves into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday with teaching, wrestling with the truth, and even a warning of what is to come. On Monday, Thursday, Jesus puts two simple ideas into practice at the Last Supper, loving God and loving others with all yourself. At midnight, we turn with a crisis into Holy Friday towards the low point of the cross. Black Saturday leaves me wondering, what if Jesus didn't come? What if he didn't erase sin? What if he didn't rise again? And then Sunday morning comes with the excitement of a risen Lord that changes everything. And by Sunday evening, I'm enjoying the peace and calm of a walk to Emmaus with Jesus. It's a marvelous week. I was excited to find John 13 in the lectionary for today. The verses I chose, 21 through 30, show the character of Jesus. And I hoped we could meditate on how we might find follow his example. The scene is at the Last Supper. Jesus and the disciples are in the upper room. It's near the end of the meal. Jesus makes an announcement. There's a betrayer at the table. The disciples respond in disbelief and challenge Jesus' assertion. How can this be? They ask. Jesus makes the big reveal and releases Judas into the night. Now, as we read through the passage, we already know that Jesus has warned of being betrayed before. We already know that Judas has made a deal with Jewish leaders and is just waiting for the right time to betray Jesus. But Jesus invites Judas to the meal anyway. If I were in his place, I don't think I'd do this. I wondered what would be my options. I might rescue Judas, quietly go to him, confront him, debate with him, and turn him back to the right cause. I might decide to use him, call him out publicly on my own timing for political gain, propel the cause forward through Judas's downfall. I might decide to neutralize him, limit his access, cut him off from information, turn everyone away from him. Some leaders would try to kill him, to stop the damage in its tracks. Jesus does none of these. He says, the one who takes bread from me after I dip it in the oil will betray me. I don't know about you, but I would sit on my hands and stare at the ground. I'd do anything but be interested in that piece of bread. Jesus states the facts and holds out his hand. I imagine him scanning around the table and then coming back to Judas. Judas would be waiting, meeting his gaze, wondering what to do next. What must Jesus be thinking? As I contemplate the scene, I see a new option. Jesus is loving Judas. He's caring for Judas. He's wanting Judas to do anything 
but reach out and take that piece of bread. This is the character of Jesus. He loves sinners. Hate the sin, but love the sinner. We've all heard it. This popular saying can be mostly traced back to St. Augustine. But I see no hate here in this passage. No tirade, no rants, no lectures. Jesus models being known by what he's for, not what he's against. He's longing to say to Judas, as he did the adulteress, go, sin no more. To Jesus, where we're going matters, not where we've been, not what we've done. Why is it so hard to love the sinner? In thinking about this in my life, I've come with, up with four possible answers. The first is we may not see as God does. Nowhere is this truer, perhaps, than ourselves. The hardest person to love may be ourselves. I'm not talking about indulgence. I'm not talking about pretending. I'm talking about seeing as God sees. Not eventually, not someday, not with some work, not with some cleanup, but now. Self-talk is often destructive, and it's love killing. My self-image may be someone who's overweight, someone who's loud, someone who's unathletic and uncoordinated. Someone who talks so often when he should be listening. Someone unable to part with things he should. But God may see someone he made holy. Someone he gifted. Someone he gave talents to. Someone who shares passion with him. Someone who's thrifty, perhaps. One of my clients calls this self-compassion. I think he's wise beyond his years. Another reason we may have trouble loving the sinner is that we can't find our compassion. Compassion means to feel with. It's not condoning. It's not excusing. It's not accepting. Jesus models this with his quiet, amazing act of holding out his hand. How do we react when someone is rude, when they diss us, when they don't respect us? Do we label them? Do we write them off? Do we call them stupid? Do we call them an idiot? Or can we wonder why? Can we wonder why does this work for this person? Why do they need to behave this way? What about their day makes this the best they can do? I struggle with this one, too. I can take someone's misbehavior and make it all about me. I can make up stories faster than anyone about how the person is hurting me and wronging me. But really, they're just trying to get by. It's about them. I can't help but believe that Jesus may have been tempted, must have been tempted, to make Judas's betrayal about Jesus. But it wasn't. It was about who Judas is. A third reason we may have trouble loving the sinner is we just aren't tough enough. We look the other way. We ignore. We avoid. This is especially hard for people we're close to. If you have a relationship with someone, one of the highest forms of love can be truth-telling. A friend of mine dropped by the house recently after pleasantries. He jumped into a quiz for me about my life balance, my happiness, my dealing with areas of my life that need healing. These were tough questions. But tough questions are the hallmark of a caring relationship. This is how Jesus loved. The last reason I'm going to share today 
that we may have trouble loving the sinner is we just don't love extravagantly enough. Sometimes we have to love with the hope that the message gets through despite the odds. Sometimes we have to love over and over again, even if it doesn't seem to be working. Jesus did a lot of this, and I think we must too. Sometimes this is easy for me. I can be gracious and expect nothing in return some days. Other days, I get caught up. I can feel that someone doesn't deserve my love. But this is just not Jesus' way. We have a Savior who didn't consider Godhood above all else. He came down here, and he lived among men and women. He hung out with sinners. He loved sinners. He ministered to sinners. Hebrews says he was tempted in every way. Whatever the sin in your life, in my life, in the sinner's life, if Hebrews 4 can be trusted, Jesus was tempted that way too. He knows. He understands. He gets it. And the good news is, Jesus is willing to take the blame for sinners. All sinners. All sinners who will but ask for pardon and who want something better. Jesus has humbled himself for you and for me. He has died on a cross for you and for me. And he has risen from that death. And as our head advocate, he's a sinner loving, sinner pursuing, sinner saving God. And he invites us, he commands us to follow his example. Pray with me. What amazing love you have for me, Lord, for us, for the world. We are sinners. We are your sinners. Help us to respond to who you are. Help us to know that you love us. Help us to boldly and extravagantly love others as you have loved us. Amen. And now for benediction. May you know Jesus' love for you this day and always. May your heart break for what breaks his. May you receive blessing upon blessing and love upon love from Jesus. May you boldly and extravagantly give it away. Go now in peace. Go in love and go with God.